Today, we are finishing our message series called Firm Foundations. We've been looking at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And today, one of the commandments we're going to look at is a commandment that my mom instilled in me. My mom taught me this commandment. She repeated this commandment and reminded me of this commandment. And so let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Now, my mom taught me, do not take the Lord's name in vain. My mom taught me that I'm not allowed to use God's name as a curse word or a swear word. I I wasn't allowed to say things like, oh my God, or I swear to God. I wasn't even allowed, I would get in trouble if I said gosh or golly, because those were substitutes for God's name, and that's just as bad as using his name. Anybody else raised like that, or is it just me? But that's how my mom taught me. And so today, we're going to look at two of the Ten Commandments, Numbers 3 and Numbers uh, 5. We're going to look at these two commandments together. And these commandments all have to do with the theme of honor. Honor is our theme today. We're talking about honor. That commandment we just read is about honoring God's name. And then the next commandment we're going to read is about honoring others. Take a look at verse 12. We read, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So this message today is all about honor. And here's how I want you to think about honor with me. I want you to think about honor as vertical honor and horizontal honor. There's two approaches to honor. So if we look here, you and I, we are going to honor God vertically. We give honor to God in his name. And we're going to honor others horizontally, other people, other family members. We're going to honor others. So this is honor vertically and honor horizontally. So let's talk first about honor vertically. Let's talk about honoring God's name. I brought along with me uh, this three-legged stool because I think there are three components or three legs to honoring God's name. Now let me ask you, as you look at this three-legged stool, which of these legs is the most important leg? That's a trick question. Now, which leg could I remove and not compromise the stool? That's another trick question. I want to talk about three components or three legs to honoring God's name. Because I think there are three ways that we might dishonor God's name. And so the first one, the first leg is misusing God's name carelessly. That's the first leg, misusing God's name carelessly. In the NIV translation, Exodus 27 says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Now, this is what I learned from my mom. This is what mom taught me. Do not use God's name as a swear word or a curse word. Do not say, I swear to God, I'm telling the truth or whatever. Don't misuse it. James chapter 5 says, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Misusing God's name carelessly dishonors God's name. Now, the second leg of this stool, the, th- the, the second component, is misrepresenting God's name. Misrepresenting his name dishonors his name. If you think about the name Christian, the name Christ is in the name Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, are you representing Christ well? The name Christian was first given to the believers in the first century in the city of Antioch, and it was a pejorative term. Uh, the, The name Christian in that culture meant little Christ. And so people would degrade and mock believers by saying, oh, look at these little Christs, these people who follow Jesus. They think they're like Jesus, these little Christs. And so it was used as a degrading term, these Christians. But over the years, Christians took up that name and they carried it with honor, 1 Peter chapter 4 tells us, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We bear the name Christ. So how you speak, how you conduct yourself, how you behave at work and at school, it represents Jesus. We carry the name of Jesus. In the book of Acts, we read about the apostles being 
uh, arrested for preaching in the name of Jesus. And they were beaten and they were flogged and commanded not to preach in the name of Jesus. But in Acts chapter 5, it says that they left their beating, they left their uh, flogging, celebrating that they were founded worthy of suffering dishonor for the name, for the name of Jesus. And so we represent the greatest name by carrying the name Christian. At the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus. It's his name at which demons run and flee. In the name of Jesus, the sick are healed. In the name of Jesus, the lost are saved. In the name of Jesus, addiction is broken. In the name of Jesus, there is hope and the dead are raised. That's the name that we bear when we say, I'm a Christian. And so we represent Jesus. So that's the, that's the second component of this command. Now the third component, the third leg of honoring God's name we dishonor God's name when we misspeak in God's name. Misspeaking in God's name. Have you ever met anyone who told you, God told me to tell you? Have you ever heard that? Or the Lord told me to say this to you? Well, two things. First, I absolutely believe that God speaks to us. I absolutely believe that God's Holy Spirit communicates to us. He can give us prophetic messages, words of knowledge, words of wisdom. God's spirit does speak to us, and he will share things that we have no way of knowing without the supernatural gift of God. Now, secondly, I believe we have to be very wise in how we steward what we hear from the Lord and how we disclose what we hear from the Lord. And we must be very discerning about what we receive when somebody shares with us a message that they've received from God. Because we have seen examples of people who misuse God's name and, and, and misspeak on behalf of God. And they will uh, use God's name to coerce or to manipulate or advance a human agenda or even abuse other people by saying, God told me. You may have seen people on the internet who are making a name for themselves by saying, God told me this event in the world was going to happen, but, but it didn't happen. Or those who try to predict uh, political and government things. God told me, but it didn't happen. Or there are some making a name for themselves by trying to predict or claim when Jesus returns and the, the world will end, but it hasn't happened. You see, when we misspeak for God, it misuses and dishonors his name. Theologian R.T. Kendall writes this. Saying, the Lord told me, misuses the name of the Lord. It is merely name dropping. No matter how deeply people feel that they have a word from the Lord, they do not need to make this claim. Instead, they should let their hearers see for themselves that this is a word from the Lord. So if I say to you, God told me, or if I say to you, the Lord said, thus saith the Lord, I'm not making God look more impressive. I'm trying to impress you with my spirituality. I'm trying to impress you with my supernatural gift. And that, that's a form of pride. And so that's one reason why here at Church of the Crossing we have some guidelines about hearing from God. Our, our prayer partners, our prayer teams, our leaders are trained that when we hear from God, we try to speak in humility. And we say, can I share something with you? This may be from God or it may not be. Or as I'm praying for you, this is coming to my mind, you need to discern if this is from the Lord. We want to speak in humility. We want to represent his name well. Remember, honor has two parts. There's vertical honor and there's horizontal honor. We honor God by honoring his name, and then we honor others. That's the horizontal honor. My mom taught me to address adults with honor when, when I was growing up. Um, my mom taught me to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Uh, my mom taught me to call the parents of my friends Mr. and Mrs. Uh, my dad's doctor friends were Dr. True, Dr. Roman, Dr. Martin, uh, pastors at church, Pastor David, Pastor Eric. That's how my mom taught me to speak with honor. We honor God and how we honor others. That horizontal honor also honors God, especially when we honor our father and our mothers. Now, this commandment, honor your father and your mother, is first introduced in the Old Testament in the Ten Commandments, but it's a command that gets a lot of attention in the New Testament. Jesus talks about this commandment. The Apostle Paul writes about this commandment. We read in one of Paul's letters in Ephesians, it says, children, 
Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So Paul points out here that this, this, this command has a promise that, that you will enjoy long life. It will go well with you. Does this mean that if you honor your parents that you're going to live to be 100 years old? Well, I hope so. I mean, that, that'd be great. I, I, I'd, I'd be happy with that. I think, though, even more meaningfully, the heart of this command and this promise is that honor is a pathway to a blessed life, no matter how long your days are. Because honor begets honor, and there are God's blessings and God's favor on those who show honor and those who receive honor. I've been thinking a lot about this command, honor your father and mother, now that I've become a parent. Um, Shepherd is, is now four months old, so I've been a parent for four months, which means I know everything about parenting. And so when I'm changing Shepherd's diaper, his smelly, stinky, dirty diaper, I whisper in his ear, I'm doing this because I love you, and one day you're going to show me honor and change my diapers when I'm super old. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I don't say that, but it has crossed my mind. When I turned 18 years old, I graduated from high school, and I sat down with my dad for breakfast. We sat down at a diner in my hometown, and we ordered breakfast, and I had just graduated from high school, and I was planning to go to college near my hometown in Ohio, but then a church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania reached out and invited me to join the staff team and do youth ministry at the church, and I decided that I was going to accept that invitation and move to Pennsylvania and go to college there. And so at this breakfast meeting with my dad, I shared with him my plans and told him how I'd been invited, told him my plans to move, pack up, and, and go and go to school there. And my dad later told me that during our conversation, his mind was catching up to everything I was saying, and he realized halfway through our discussion that this was not an advice meeting. This was an inf information meeting. I was informing him about my decision. I didn't ask for my parents' advice. I didn't seek their wisdom or their counsel. I didn't honor them. And that's something I regret. Uh, I don't regret the decision I made, but, but I regret that I didn't honor my parents. And so as we talk about honoring others, honoring our parents, honoring our grandparents, honoring those that God has put in our life, just like there's three legs to this stool, I want to make three observations about honoring others. And the first thing is that sometimes honor gets confused with respect. And I want to say that honor is given, respect is earned. We respect people because they've earned it. We respect people because they conduct themselves like Christ. They, they have character. They have integrity. They, they've earned our respect. Honor is something that we give to everyone. It's something that we do to honor the dignity and the value of everyone because everyone's created in the image of God. And I understand that for some of us, honoring a parent in particular can be complicated because there might be some baggage in the past. There might be some wounds, some disappointment. There may be even some dysfunction in the family that you've come from. And some will ask, well, what about an absent parent? What about an abusive parent? What about a selfish parent? Do they deserve honor? No, they may not deserve, but we honor everyone. Honor is given. Respect is earned. There's a scene in the TV show Band of Brothers. It's a TV show about World War II soldiers. And it's a scene that I think of frequently when I think about honor is given, respect is earned. In this scene, there are two officers that encounter each other, Officer Winters and Officer Sobel. Now, Officer Winters has been promoted up to the rank of major. But back when Officer Winters was a lieutenant, Officer Sobel was his commanding officer. And Sobel mistreated Winters. Sobel treated him poorly. But now, in this scene, Officer Winters outranks him. And Captain Sobel, when he sees this man, who used to be under his command, who is now his superior officer, Officer Sobel tries to act like he doesn't see him, tries to walk past him, and he doesn't salute him. And then Major Winters says something. He says, Captain Sobel, we salute the rank, not the man. Honor is given. Respect is earned. 
Notice what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Do you know what kind of emperor was ruling Rome when Peter wrote this? Not a very good one. Not a very nice one. It was likely uh, the emperor Domitian who uh, abused Christians, killed Christians, persecuted Christians. In fact, Domitian labeled himself with the title Lord and God. Now you tell me, is that somebody that Christians should respect? Absolutely not. Yet we're commanded to honor the emperor, honor everyone. Do we honor those who don't love God? Yes. Those who make fun of our faith or disrespect our faith? Yes. Honor is given. Respect is earned. You can honor someone even if you don't like them. When we honor fathers and mothers, when we honor grandparents, when we honor others, we are honoring God. We are embodying the humility and the character of Jesus. Now, at this point, some Christians have a question, and they say, What if obeying God displeases my parents or displeases my family? What what if my family doesn't love Jesus and and they don't approve of my faith? Well, a couple of things. One, that, that is a real question, valid question. Two, I think that is often the exception and not the rule. You see, we must obey God no matter what other people think about that, or even if it displeases others. But you don't have to be a jerk about your faith. You don't have to be arrogant about your faith. You can still show honor even if it creates displeasure. Jesus even talks about this. In Matthew chapter 10, and 10, Jesus says, I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now this sounds like a harsh teaching, but here's, I believe the proper interpretation of this scripture is that Jesus is saying there will be some family members who accept Jesus as Lord and some family members who reject Jesus as Lord. Jesus is telling us that the gospel will divide families because of their own choices. And those who reject Jesus as Lord have made believers their enemies. I once met a young man who grew up in a Muslim family, raised as a Muslim. And as a young adult, he decided that he didn't want to be Muslim anymore. And he started exploring Christianity, started learning about Jesus And then he told his Muslim business partner and his Muslim parents that he wasn't a Muslim anymore. How do you think that went for him? Well, his business partner cut him out of the business and took all of their earnings and all of their capital, leaving him without resources, without income. So now he's dependent on his parents, but he just told them that he's not a Muslim. And his parents have essentially disowned him. They, they, they live in the same house, but it's not a home. They're roommates. They don't talk to him. They don't acknowledge him. They don't speak to him. His parents have made him their enemy because he's no longer a Muslim. But what does Jesus say about treating our enemies? He says we love our enemies. We pray for our enemies. We bless our enemies. We honor our enemies. Now, you may be hearing these words, and someone might be thinking, Andrew, just tell me what honor is. Just tell me what honor is. Define it for me. Give me a list. Give me a a step-by-step guide, and I will do what you say to show honor. And so this week, I have prepared, worked really hard to prepare a step-by-step guide for you on how you show honor to others, how you show honor to your parents, to your grandparents. And sadly, I'm going to disappoint many of you because I don't have a step-by-step guide on how to show honor. It'd be foolish of me to try and prescribe to you how to show honor to the people in your life. Because I don't know your relationships. I don't know your context. So what I'd like to do is encourage you to ask yourself these questions. Ask yourself, do I honor God by how I treat my parents? How I speak to my parents? By how I talk about my parents? How I think about my parents? Only you can answer these questions. And if you find yourself justifying something or making some excuses, like, well, I'm just venting about my frustration. Well, maybe there's some work to be done. I have a friend who is living in a unique season in life. He is right in the middle of the sandwich generation. Do you know what the sandwich generation is? It's, it's those adults who are in their late 40s, in their 50s, 
who are raising children, maybe even grown children, but they've also got parents who are aging and need a little bit more support. And so they're like in the sandwich between two generations. My friend Dale is living smack dab in the middle of the sandwich generation. On one hand, he's got grown kids, he's got a granddaughter, he's got a second grandchild on the way. And on the other hand, his father is aging and uh, has some real health needs right now. Dale told me that in one day, in one day, he was in the morning babysitting his granddaughter, and then in the afternoon, he was helping his dad at, at physical therapy. Like, he's living in both extremes. And if you can relate to that, you know how it can feel a little bit disorienting. You know how it can be a little bit challenging, and there's like no manual, like, turn to page 10 to learn how to help your parents who need some extra support. And so this is the, the, the second observation I want to make, like the second of the three-legged stool you will not outgrow honor. You will not outgrow giving honor. You will not outgrow receiving honor. Even if you have children that you're raising, you still honor your parents. Even if your parents have passed, you honor their memory and their legacy. Honor might look different when our parents are older and need more support and care. Jesus actually argued with some of the religious leaders about this commandment. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus says, For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you, that's the Pharisees, the religious leaders, you say that if anyone declares what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. Okay, what is Jesus talking about? What is Corbin? Corbin was a Jewish tradition that if you sold property or you had some money and you wanted to give this to God's work or God's mission, you would put it in Corbin, like, like an escrow account. So think of it this way. If you sell property or sell some stocks or you got some earnings, you say, I want to take this and I want to give it to God's work. So you might put it in an escrow account or you might put it in a charitable fund that can be used for God's work. But then what if unexpectedly your parents have some health concerns or they're ill and they've got medical bills or they need treatment or they need care, but all your resources are tied up in this account under Corbin, what do you do? Well, the Pharisees of Jesus' day would say, you can't touch those resources because you dedicated it to God. You can't honor your father and mother. Honoring our parents can look different when they are older and need support and need care. I'll give you two examples, two completely different examples. On one hand, I know a family here in the United States who has an older aging relative who's, who's lived in their home with them, and they, they've, they've been a family. Now that relative has some health needs that require more care, more attention, and this family's trying to decide, do we, do we switch to assisted living? Do we switch to professional care? On the other hand, I was speaking with one of my friends from our Arabic-speaking congregation who grew up in Egypt, where there's a completely different culture than the United States. And my friend told me that in Egypt... It's common for parents and children to have their grandparents and their great-grandparents all live in the same home and, and live out their days because that shows honor. And my friend told me that if an Egyptian were to put their parent or grandparent in assisted living or into uh, professional care, they would be shamed in their community. It's incredibly dishonoring to their family. And so which one is right? Well, it's, it's, it's not always black and white. It depends on the context, depends on the family, depends on the culture. I personally know one family who helped one of their older relatives and, and they lived out their days in, in their home and in their family. At the same time, another older relative needed professional care and, and they worked with a, a treatment place, professional care for them. They did both because that's what was best for those relationships. If you're living in the sandwich generation and you're feeling this pressure, I want to encourage you today that God is with you. There is grace for you. If you feel like, where's the manual, where's the how-to instructions, I want to tell you, don't feel shame, don't feel guilt, don't give in to the pressures and expectations that other people put on you. You may not have a manual, but you've got God with you. You've got the Spirit of God guiding you, and He's going to help you. And so that's why I want to encourage you to ask yourself this question. As you honor your parents, ask yourself, am I doing the best I can with what I have? 
Are you doing your best? Or are you just doing the minimum? Are you doing the best you can? Or are you just doing enough to satisfy your conscience or, 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 or just the minimum? Are you doing the best you can with your resources, the best you can to show love, the best you can to support? Are you praying with and loving, showing the love of God to your family, to those that God's called you to honor? In Exodus chapter 20, God gives us the Ten Commandments. He, he, he lays down the instructions for following him and, and obeying him. And there's one thing that God says in Exodus chapter 20 that is really unusual. Um, he, he says something that's puzzled me, and it's, many scholars have debated what God is talking about here. In verse 4, he says, You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind, or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God and will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay, now this is the part that's puzzling. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. Now, this is the part that's puzzling. As I read this, I wonder, why did God say this? Why did God say that children will suffer the consequences of their parents? Why did he include this? And here's the conclusion that I reached. Now, I haven't read this in any Bible commentaries or other scholars, so I could be wrong. But I wonder if God is warning families about generational sins and generational curses. I wonder if God is warning them that when you bring an idol into your home, you're inviting demonic forces into your home. You're inviting evil spirits into your home. And we know that demons and evil spirits can torment and oppress families for generations. Now, you probably don't have a little gold statue in your, an idol in your home that you pray to. But God says he will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. What do you give your affection to? There are modern day idols in this world, things that we love more than God sometimes, things that we worship more than God sometimes. Those modern day idols will influence our children and our grandchildren. What you honor will create generational curses or generational blessings. And you may be young, you may be single, you may be in college, and, and, and you, don't, you can't even think about having children or a family. I want to tell you, the decisions that you make now will produce generational curses or generational blessings. I've seen this in my family. Both Lauren and I, we come from parents, both of our parents are divorced, and their parents are divorced, multiple generations we see examples where addiction issues in a parent get transferred to a child. Uh, I've seen men learn from their fathers how to mistreat and abuse women. I've seen daughters learn from their mothers how to manipulate and take advantage of men. We see the generational consequences. I have a very good friend um, who grew up in a home that did not love Jesus. He's a Christian now, but growing up, his parents, his family did not love Jesus, and sadly, he was introduced to pornography as a little boy, and he struggled with that his whole life until he came to faith in Jesus. Where do you think he was introduced to that sin? His father. His father approved of that sin in their home. I met a young woman who struggled with night terrors and sleep paralysis. She would often wake up in the middle of the night. She couldn't cry out. She couldn't move. And she'd feel this demonic presence sitting over her. And she wanted to be free of this. And so I asked her all the, the standard questions about inviting evil. Uh, do you use Ouija boards? No. Tarot cards? No. Horoscopes? No. Palm reading? No, no, no. And then she told me that her dad often suffered the same conditions, sleep paralysis and night terrors. And I said, tell me more about your dad and his family. And then I learned that her father's mother was a fortune teller. And dark things like that, evil things like that, invite sin and evil, and we see how it torments generation after generation. Thankfully, that young woman renounced those generational sins in the name of Jesus, and she was free of those night terrors. And so this is the third observation. The, if we're talking about three legs of a stool, the third observation is that your children will honor what you honor. 
Your children will honor what you honor. If you value integrity, if you value character and honesty and humility, your children are going to learn those qualities. Your children will value what you value. They will honor what you honor. A friend of mine is raising a teenage son. And recently, this teenage boy has started working and earning a little bit of money for himself. And one day after church, the family was driving away from the church, and the teenage boy said, wait, stop, we have to go back to the church building. And a little bit puzzled, his parents asked why, and he explained that he still had his tithe offering that he wanted to give before they left the church. And so they turned around and came back in, and he put his gift in the, in the lockbox in the back. Your children will honor what you honor. Now understand that you may be hearing this and there might be something going on inside of you because you've got baggage from your family of origin. There's some stuff in the past. There's some junk in the past. There might be some dysfunction. There might be a lot of disappointment. There might be um, uh, some, some, some destructive patterns. And, and, and you've promised yourself that you're not going to commit the sins of your father. You're not going to go down the same path that your mom went down. And I've heard many Christians who say, I'm going to break the cycle. And I understand what they're saying. But I think God wants to do something deeper than just break the cycle. I believe God wants to heal the wound. He wants to bring healing to the wound. He wants to heal the heart. He wants to heal the disappointment. He wants to heal the regret. He wants to heal that baggage and that trauma. In Exodus 20, he says that the sins of the parents will visit to the third and fourth generation. But then, in verse 6, he says, I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. God's love heals the hurt of the past. God's love heals the hurt in the family of origin. God's love transforms and God's love fixes what was broken. And so here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to tell you. If you're feeling this tension, if you're feeling this stuff from the past, the family of origin coming back up, here's what I want to tell you today. Speak the name of Jesus over your past. Speak the name of Jesus over your pain. Honor the name of Jesus because at the name of Jesus, lives are changed. Stories are rewritten. Will you speak the name of Jesus over your family, over your children, over your grandchildren? Because it is the name that changes family trajectories. It's the name that changes what has been broken and corrupted by sin. Philippians 2 says that God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above what? Above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the Lord of your heart? Is he the Lord of your home? Have you honored the name of Jesus in your life? There's healing in the name of Jesus. And so I want to end by telling you just a little story about my family of origin. When I look at my family of origin, I'm kind of a unique part of my family. And I'm talking about like my immediate family, my brothers and sisters and my parents, my, my grandparents. And as far as I know, there, there's nobody in my immediate family that's in vocational pastoral ministry like I am. I've got some relatives, but like my, my family of origin, there's nobody else doing what I'm doing. I didn't really follow the, the traditional or expected path in my family of origin. You see, my mom is an accountant and successful businesswoman. My dad's a surgeon. I didn't go into medicine. I don't like blood. I don't want to be around blood. I've got a grandfather who was in the military, served honorably in the military. I know I'm too soft to make it through boot camp. I've got another grandfather who was a successful entrepreneur, businessman. He negotiated millions and millions of business uh, dollars in business deals. Great negotiator. I am not a good negotiator. Uh, the young guy that's cutting my grass this spring was going to charge me $30, and I ended up paying him $35 just because I felt bad. Like, I don't negotiate. And so... Being a pastor doesn't seem like a natural trajectory for my family of origin until I learned about my maternal grandmother named Veda. And I've talked about her before. I didn't 
know her well because I was just barely one years old when she passed away, but I've learned about her remotely from a distance. You see, my grandmother was a disciple maker and an evangelist. She studied the Bible. She traveled the country speaking at women's, Christian women's connection events. She would uh, analyze the Bible. I've read her sermon transcripts typed out on a typewriter, her testimonies, her stories. I've read through her Bible and seen her, her notes. She boldly stood in front of crowds of hundreds of people proclaiming the gospel, telling people about Jesus. And as I read through her transcripts, I saw that she would often use stories to talk about Jesus. She even used props on stage to talk about Jesus. Does that sound familiar? She would give altar calls and invitations to faith, and many, many people came to know Jesus because of her ministry. And I realized, like, even though I didn't know her, I've got some things in common with her. Her spirituality is in my DNA. Her influence is in my life because she honored Jesus. The generations that come after you will learn from you. Your influence Your witness, your testimony, your honor will influence those to come. And so here's what we're going to do now. Now we're going to transition into an opportunity to receive anointing. Because I believe God wants to release more of his love and more of his presence into many here. And so first, I want to invite all of us to stand together. And as we're standing, if you're a prayer partner, please come forward. You can get ready here in the front. And I want to extend two invitations to anointing. And if you'd like to receive anointing, just come down this center aisle and Cheryl will help direct you to a prayer partner. First, I want to invite moms, grandmas, stepmoms, all women who have a desire to be used by Jesus For his glory. If you are a woman who loves Jesus, who wants more of Jesus, who wants to see Jesus multiply in your life, I want to invite you to come forward and receive anointing and receive more of his love. We want to pray over you. And in addition to that, I want to extend this invitation to everyone who needs more of God's love and more of God's hope. If you're hurting, if you need a miracle, if you feel broken, If you've got a physical pain or illness, we'd love to pray for healing for that. So everyone's invited. Let me pray for us to open this moment and then you're invited to come forward as you're led. Father God, thank you for your grace and thank you for your presence. God, thank you that we have a hope in Jesus. And so God, I pray for every woman here that you would release more of your spirit into their lives, that you would multiply their influence for the kingdom, that you would multiply their influence of the gospel. And God, I pray for every single person who wants to honor you, that wants to glorify you, that more of your power would embolden them to walk in obedience to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.